Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the sales leader's playbook. Today we welcome an all-star sales leader, Patrick Ball. Patrick is the Chief Revenue Officer at Privitar. This is his seventh startup destined for a unicorn status. Patrick has perfected the formula of turning raw talent into superstars. Watch this episode to discover his playbook. special edition series, The 33 CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. I'm Simon Kutis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Hey, everyone. And we are delighted to welcome Patrick Ball. Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Welcome, Looking Patrick. To it. Great. So, Patrick, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you on the show today. So, you're currently Chief Revenue Officer at Privitar. Could you just tell us a little bit about um, the company, a little bit about your role there and what you've been brought in to do? Great. We, uh, we're a data privacy company, so we help the biggest companies in the world work with their sensitive data. So privacy is obviously top of mind uh, in the world at large, and we help de-identify, work with large data sets, enforce compliance, migrate to the cloud, all the things that have to do with sensitive data. Great. And you, you've only recently joined, so um, around kind of six months ago, I think it was um, right, late De- last December year. December 1. Yep. Right. And uh, you've also just gone through a nice round of, uh, of funding. So Series C, congratulations. Thank you. Interesting yes. timing. <laughs> so actually, that's, a, that's probably a, a good place to start. Um, you know, obviously, this whole series is very much around the, the, the success of this group of individuals. And, you know, obviously, one of the things that we're trying to ascertain is, has success been following them? Or have they been creating their own success? So I, I suppose in the context of your situation right now, what is it that you were brought in to do? And why did they target you? Really, really go scale. So um, it's a London based software company. So the headquarters in London, there was very few resources in North America. And uh, we closed the Series B last April, really to go scale sales and marketing. Series C was not closed by the time I started. So that was just really good timing. Um, And we really needed to go to market in the US and expand. So I think it would have been difficult to do that from London in the US and so I um, had a connection to Excel who was a lead VC on the Series B round from my from my days at Cloudera. So they knew me, I knew them. Uh, they called me up and I was sort of looking around in the market and um, everything just checked out. Right market, I knew privacy was big, not going away. I knew the big data space from Cloudera. It really just inter- Sected extremely well. Um, right VCs, right stage for me. They needed to go scale. I knew I could recruit well. Right leadership team. Um, so it checked. It checked a lot of those boxes for me. Yeah. So uh, I suppose it's interesting that you mentioned about Excel obviously targeting you. So so was it always kind of part of the plan to? come on in order to secure the next round or, or was that kind of kind of 
part of the negotiation of you kind of being part of the kind of place in that part in that position or I, I think that picked up a lot of momentum I don't that might have been some conversations before I started but that wasn't part of the part of the plan uh, I would say it hopefully I added value in that process <laughs> as me being here yeah. uh, and, the, and the investors feeling comfortable with me at the head so great nice so, just just going back to uh, the story that we're telling today. So obviously, you know, you're part of a very elite group, you know, these 33 Blade Logic execs that we're obviously referring to as part of this, uh, this very special series that we're putting together. When we obviously reached out to you, um, one of the things that you first said to us that it kind of fills you with pride to be part of this story. Just tell us a little bit about, you know, what it means to you and, and, and why that is. Well, the, just the the success of of Blade Logic as a company was very good. Went public, got acquired, but the level of talent and what we have all gone on to do, I think, is just un, unbelievable. And it starts with John McMahon, obviously, who is now a legend in the Valley. <laughs> I don't I don't think he had that cachet when he was at Blade Logic, but certainly after that, you know, the companies that he's touched or been a part of um you know like snowflake like mongo it's just incredible right and um i think i told you guys when we talked earlier my first qbr at play logic looking around the room and i was always a successful rep number one two of my company companies and the level of talent and pedigree with that outside sales force of 30 guys or so gals was was unbelievable so i, I that is a large part of it. And some of the names that you guys have inter interviewed uh, are, are friends of mine and I either worked for them or we, we worked together at Blade Logic. So that, you know, that helped. <laughs> Amazing. So look, I think what's really interesting is obviously taking it back to your, your, your very early part of becoming you and you spoke quite highly about, you know, even before your career and football and, how that set you up for success um, and a particular mentor and, and a coach that really got the best out of yeah. you at a very sort of young and impressionable age. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? And Sure. American football. American football. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> English kidding. Viewers, yeah. That is. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was super fortunate to, to, uh, to attend a private uh, boys Catholic school here in the Bay area. Uh, which my brother had attended. So I'd, I'd been around the school probably since I was 10 years old, 800 kids, um, and turned, turned out to be one of the most successful, uh, high school football programs in the history of the country. Um, you've, you might've seen a, uh, a movie when the game stands tall, that was a movie about the program. Um, Post me, they wound up winning 151 games in a row. So they went 12 seasons with an undefeated streak, which, and, and they played every, we played everybody, all, all comers from California, from out of state. Uh, but as far as the program, Bob Latticer uh, was the head coach under my tenure. I think he was 32 when I played for him. And you would have thought he was 50, just the way he carried himself. But um, real hard work. We grinded and real accountability, just getting the best out of every individual player. That was his style. He figured that out, how to, how to motivate the individual. Um, great team chem chemistry. And we became a family, and it showed. And we weren't the biggest. We weren't the fastest. But, you know, through, through that conditioning and hard work and studying and getting better every day, that, that it showed. And for him, it was a higher purpose. It wasn't just about the wins. It was about doing the right things and putting in the effort. And the, the win was the byproduct of that. So if to, to pull it forward, I do see a lot of similarities between him and John <laughs> McMahon. It was just in a different context. So yeah. So to experience two life changing or people that yeah. have helped shape you. Right. To who you right. are today or being influential twice you yeah. know quite considerably is is a really interesting yeah, those, part of like, story. my my 
my core group of best friends I, are still my high school buddies that we played football with. So nice. And nice. my son's a freshman, so it's it's cool to see him go through the same thing. And <laughs> not, they not much well? has changed. He's are got they doing a, as well? Oh yeah, yeah. He's got a his workout is a white T-shirt and green shorts and his name on the back, and there's no individuals. So it's love that. pretty cool. Absolutely love that. Fantastic. So you've graduated from high school. You've gone um and started uh in real estate right um yep, where you became... in, went to usc started in commercial real estate uh didn't really know what i wanted to do um my parents were getting a divorce at that time so all of a sudden i had no air cover and i had to figure <laughs> it out fast and uh my dad was very successful he was in in heavy construction but i didn't i didn't really have the passion for that um, and so I decided to in, get involved in commercial real estate in San Francisco. Where you were rookie. There was a lot of that at the time as well. <laughs> but so, so how did you. Go on, Simon, you carry on, mate. Sorry, I was going to say, so, so how did you make the transition from real estate into, uh, software? Uh, I, 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 I was successful. I was doing well. Um, but I saw what was happening around me in Silicon Valley and I was representing some of those software companies and, um, you know, Oracle was big. They had a huge, uh, it was called DMD. It was their, their inside sales force, um, which is where Benioff actually started. Um, and I, I just saw a lot of activity and a lot of upside and it, and it really piqued my interest. And so. I got involved uh, with a company, a really small company called Intraware out of Arinda, which is in the East Bay, which was a Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins company. And geez, I think I was number 35. So I, I started out as an SDR. I took a pay cut because um, I was making more money in real estate, but I believed in it. Great CEO, one of my favorite companies I've ever worked for. And uh, a guy named Peter Jackson, who's a serial entrepreneur, he's, he's started and sold multiple companies. Um, probably the most sales-driven CEO I've worked work for. He was Cal rugby player, fraternity guy, just, just a great guy. So that was successful. We, we, it was kind of during the dot-com days. So mm -hmm. um, I, I quickly rose to the ranks. An interesting pivot point in my career was that I, I really wanted to get to the field. And so I was on my manager every day, uh, Mike Price, who who has done well for himself too. He's the, he leads all the global SDRs at PagerDuty. All right. And they had an opportunity to come up in New York City to go be a field rep. I had never even stepped foot in New York City. I was in my early or mid twenties. And he said, here's your shot. And so I flew out found an apartment and, uh, and went for it. And I remember my first sales call was at Lehman brothers and I'd, <laughs> I'd literally never been on an outside sales call. And I'm, I'm just looking up at the tower going, what the hell am I? <laughs> right. And you know what? I asked questions and I figured it out. So that was a good run. We wound up going public. Um, and we wound up getting caught up in the, in the dot com crisis, but, uh, that was a good company. So what, what, yeah, why would you say that was one of, or the most interesting and exciting roles that you've done? I just think the culture, uh, it was, it was a young company. Um, we all believed Peter was a great leader, uh, exciting time in terms of the market. We felt like we had a mission and, um, it was, it was hard work, but it was fun. And, uh, you know, we would have, we would have kegs out on the patio at Friday <laughs> for happy hour at headquarters, right? That was kind of the, the mentality and the culture back then, but it was just a good group. Amazing. And then after that, again, another in incredible job, right? Uh, Everdeen. Is it Everdeen? Yeah, Everdream. So, Everdream, so I, I, I moved my VP of sales at Intraware, took the head uh, VP of sales job at Everdream. So he pulled me over. Um, that, that was an interesting company too. I think we talked, uh, before that, um, Elon Musk was the chairman of the board of that company and, uh, his nephew, Lyndon Rive was the CEO. So, 
software as a service company uh, way ahead of its time in 2002 or 2003. So uh, I did well. I closed a lot of big deals. It was missionary sales. It was early market. Nobody knew who we were. No SDRs, none of that stuff, right? You just, you had your territory and you had to go figure out how to get it done. So um, I was always number one or t number two there. And um, and that had kind of run its course. I, I spent about four years there and then and then I got I got a knock on the door for Blade Logic. Incredible. So um you know three really interesting roles, right? Um you've obviously got a magnet or you're for for people um and interesting people. Um so from there Blade Logic, was it a, you got headhunted to join Blade Logic? I did. I did I, I, I decided to kind of break out from my network, which I've done a couple times in my career, which I think is is good to do. Um, didn't know, didn't know Blade Logic, had never heard of them, didn't know the John McMahon mystique, didn't didn't know anyone, and um, <laughs> and I, I engaged, and uh, I like Blonde Brian Blonde, who was who was my hiring manager, so I spent some time with him, and and uh, decided to come on board. Brilliant. And do you remember the day of interview with John McMahon? I, 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 I do. And I remember getting warned that he's going to, he's going to sit you down and try to break you and, and, uh, <laughs> and stare at you, and give you a mean look. And, um, and that, that kind of translate back to my De La Salle days, like Lattice was super intimidating. Didn't say a lot, but you know, he'd walk in the weight room and everybody would put their head down, right? Because they were right. they were freaked out. But so, so I was prepared for that experience. So that 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 didn't that didn't shake me too much. But uh, what did I, you do? I, Just stare back? Yeah, I mean, we we had a <laughs> we had a little stare off. I don't know if I cracked first, but you know, brilliant. So, so what is it you think that they were looking for when they brought you into into the company at the time? Uh, I mean, John has a very specific profile, you know, um, he, he likes the competitive nature. Uh, he likes people that have, uh, had, had to deal with hard things. So one of his famous interview questions is what's the hardest thing you've ever had to deal with in your life, which I, which I think is a good one. Right. I, I still use that sometimes cause you don't know what answer you're going to get. Yeah. Um, Clearly, you know, discipline, competitiveness, uh, have you been successful, all, all the all the sales traits as well in terms of consistency and uh, quota achievement, but um, very big on the on the character side of things and, and the competitiveness and the will to win. If, if we were to kind of reflect on a couple of the things that you've said so far, right? So the football team. Um, very much a team player, no individuals, no egos, hard work. Every role that you've had so far up to this point, you've obviously had to dig deep. You've been taken out of your comfort zone. You've obviously had to um, deal with adversity, um, really, really put yourself out there, challenge yourself, high pressure environments. Again, are these the kinds of character traits that you think John was really looking for when they they finally decided to take you on? I do, I do. I think uh, he probably appreciated that I had been with smaller companies that and had it done well too. I think uh, I'm trying to think about the Blade sales foresight. There probably wasn't too many IBM and Oracle type of guys that that were hired. Right? It was it was <laughs> you know, scrappiness, smart scrappers, right? That they could, they could go get it done and, and make progress every day. It deal with high you, pressure, right? It was a higher pressure environment. No question. Yeah. Cause you joined a similar sort of time to Mark Musselman, right? Uh, yeah. Within probably months of each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we, we shared the same little office in Palo Alto with, uh, <laughs> with him and, and blonde, a little executive suite off of university Avenue. And, uh, and then Adam got brought in shortly after that. And, and then we just hit another gear. So, so every organization really dreams about creating these very elite environments. Um, most of them look for 
experience. Um, but this, in this instance, it's not, it wasn't about experience. It was about the person. But what is it that you think was the key to being able to create such a high performance, such a high performing team? In terms of recruitment or once they got- Just generally, just generally in terms of, you, you mentioned I, I about- I think your, John, John, like, so John, obviously he was a good recruiter. And so were her, his first line managers. It's, it starts there, right? You have to have the right team on the field or you're not going to be successful. I think he had a really, really good way of getting buy-in from everybody in the org about his mission. Um, marketing was on the same page. Sales was on, on the same page. David Acheri was on the same page. So everybody was, was dialed in, marching down the same path. So that's, that's one thing. I think John had a very clear way of communicating. So we didn't overcomplicate stuff, um, both in just how we managed and how we, you know, got the best out of you and challenged you. But I also think from a, from a messaging standpoint um, and positioning, that was really key too. And he was big on differentiation. How are we going to be different than Opsware and go beat them in every deal, right? And and he instilled the mentality that that we weren't going to lose and if you did it was a problem right and i think uh, i never lost a deal to opsware proud of that i guess um uh in training so we were uh he was maniacal about training which i think is a big big uh contribution to to that company's success and and the whole story so um I remember one QBR, it was like a Friday and we were in Lexington, Mast, and we were all tired. We'd been through three days. I don't know if you guys have heard this story, but we had been through three days of, uh, of QBRs, forecast reviews, training, and we're just grinded. And rather than a rah-rah speech to send us on our way, McMahon grabs the microphone. And at this point, there's probably 60 field reps. And he decides to go to every single rep and, and give a little quiz to him. Hey, Patrick, name the five core differentiators right now. Oh, hey, wow. Juan, what are three customer case studies? And <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, that's a true story. We, were, we got on the bus after going, holy, can you believe that that just happened? And, uh, wow. we were, what would have happened like, if you did? What, happened, like, what would have happened if you missed? You didn't oh, feel did good about it. Miss? You did not feel good about it. Uh, there, there, of course, there's a few stutters and, and screw ups because you're on the spot in front of six of your peers. But that audible readiness uh, was huge, right? And you, you'd rather fail in that environment than in front of a customer was the mentality and it, and it worked, right? So, 100%. Yeah. And John knew, like, the, one of the really other things about him is he knew our stuff. He wasn't, he knew it cold. He was, he was technical. He had an engineering degree. So he knew how to position our product. He, he, he knew it, you know, he knew the differentiator. So he wasn't BSing his way through it, which added a whole level of credibility and respect for him. So do you remember the environment and walking into Blade Logic? And it's obviously a very different environment to the environment that you were used to or had been in the past. Yeah. When we last spoke, you mentioned, you know, surrounded by just the elites of the elites of salespeople, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the strong survived. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was a meritocracy, right? I mean, yeah. rich comp, rich comp plan. Um, if, if you did well on closed deals, you made money. And if you didn't, you didn't last very long. So it was, it was pretty binary. The targets were kept quite low, weren't they? They, they were. I think I, I, I literally had just gone through my comp plan. I've, I just found it over this COVID stuff, cleaning out files. And I think, I think my first quota was 800 grand and the base rate was super high. So it was, they weren't afraid to pay commissions for performance, which is perpetuated its way through all the comp plans in the Valley right now for the most yeah, part. Yeah. Right? So. And were you on a 50-50 split, so 50% fixed, or was it, or was it less? I, w I won't tell you my OTE, 
because yeah. it was compared to today. It's unbelievable <laughs> how, how uh, but uh, yeah, I think it was something like that. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, because yeah. uh, there was, I think there was arguments over, can we reduce our base salary, the real heavy hitting sales people were, you know, can we reduce base salary and, and look at better comp plans and higher percentages on, right. on commissions? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it sounds about right. <laughs> But, but I suppose the whole and John never, was, John never, he wouldn't negotiate a base, you know, know, now today, now a lot of AEs, I mean, they're, they're constantly want, wanting to ask for another 10 grand, 20 grand. <laughs> and his mentality would always be if, if you're negotiating over my base and you're not focused on a million dollars that you can make as an OTE, you're the wrong guy. So, uh, <laughs> I've, I've probably used that once or twice in my recruitment. <laughs> I, I, I was about to ask about how addictive, you know, that's that winning mentality can be. And, you know, was that something that you saw amongst your peers that, you know, was, there was that buzz, there was that we're winning and, and how that kind of transcended across the, the, the success of the business. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. I remember every quarter he would send out a, a long email and we were remote, right? We weren't, I wasn't certainly in Boston at headquarters, but we were a global team. And I remember every quarter he would list out every AE and the big deals that were done. And if you weren't on that list, you didn't feel good. Right. But it was, and, it, and the ante just, holy shit, we're doing that this quarter and just get, get, getting pushed up and up in terms of the type of deals we were doing and the size. Um, so absolutely. I mean, uh, competitive with one another. Um, I think the other interesting thing was he tied everybody to sales performance. So I think even down to down to finance was all about productivity and, and their comp was tied to sales performance, which was really forward thinking. And just wow. get in alignment across the entire org. So, so even back office operations had targets. Yeah. They had they weren't necessarily targets, but it was about their their bonuses or whatever were tied to enabling, you know, sales to be more productive and to have higher performance. Wow. So, we've obviously heard quite a lot of the stories. SKOs tend to tend to be quite um, intense affairs, shall we say. Um, what, what were your experiences at the SKOs? Um, so we got tested. Uh, <laughs> that was a big thing. And, and, and part of it was, you know, the, the managers instilling some fear in you that you better know your stuff. And it was true because we, we had generally entrance exams mm. to start a QBR. And if you didn't, you, you got the, the thought was you would get put on a plane and sent home. Sorry, uh, entrance okay. exams. Yeah, so we would have a quiz. It would be uh, 50, 60 questions about the competition, our value drivers, positioning, blah, 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 that we had to take and we got graded. Wow. And uh, I remember there was a lot of prep that we had to do because we were freaked out. And I remember um, I'm sitting on the patio on a Saturday and I have to leave on a Sunday to go back to the QBR in Boston. And I, I've got all the, this stack of note cards and I'm just flipping through it. Like, role based access control, and automation. And my wife's like, what are you doing? <laughs> She's like, what wow. are you in college again? And so like, literally that's how seriously we took it. And, uh, and that stuff parlayed to our performance. There was no question that it did. So, so apparently people would always look around the room because there was always a few absentees. Obviously they're the ones that didn't quite yeah. uh, make the test. Right. right? Yep. Yep. That, that happened. <laughs> wow. As you say, survival of the fittest, right? <laughs> and the strongest. So, so it, I suppose in terms of kind of reflecting on that now at the time you were uh, an account exec, um, you're obviously looking up and on the receiving end of that. As you know, obviously now having reached the levels that you have, how do you reflect on why those types of activities were kind of used, why those tactics were used at the time? Um, and and what, what, what can you, what, what have you learned from, from, from that kind of approach? 
uh, fr from just... So I, I suppose, you know, one of the things that John really tried to instill was accountability, right? That was one of his big things, knowing your product, knowing your market. Um, I, I suppose those, those are the tactics that they used then. Obviously, you having now got to the level that you have, yeah, perhaps I, might look, not use the same tactics, but I, I, I think I think leaders are leaders, and a lot of that stuff is, you know, are you a, are you a natural leader, a born leader, or can you be a made leader? I think a lot of that is just innate. I mean, if I, I if I took Bob Lattiser and put him in charge of Blade Logic sales, would he have been successful? I 100% agree with that. If I took McMahon and put him as a high school football coach, I 100% think he would be successful. So. Um, so that's one thing, but yeah, you, you, you have to be accountable. You have to drive performance and, and constantly measure and make sure that you're evaluating your weak spots and enabling your, your guys to be successful. I mean, that's, I've completely adopted that all in, right? Cause you, you have to. And how does that leadership, what, what, what sort of techniques are you using there from that leadership? Are you, are you leading through fear? Are you leading through, you know, being... Uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I often, uh, people sometimes, uh, I, I, can be, I, can, I can be quiet and, and not say a lot, and people translate that into fear and intimidation. When I, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just absorbing right. but, um I think, uh, I, I don't necessarily lead by fear, but by accountability and, and by passion, I lead from the front. Like I'm not gonna ask anybody to do something that I'm not gonna go do myself. And, and if I say I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna go do it. And I think you've gotta have a plan and you gotta get buy-in with your sales force that this guy knows what he's doing and he's done it before and, and go execute on that. Yeah. Right. And be and be consistent. So so that's what I've tried to do. Did you have much interaction with John outside of work? Is was he the same person in work as he was outside of work? Um or during during blade or post blade? Any time really. It's just be interesting. No one's actually spoken about everybody's always spoken about his characteristics in work. He, I'm just so wondering he, if that was just you know, him as a I, as a person. I, I, I think he didn't he didn't hang around a lot. Um you know, he, he, he wasn't, uh, the VP of sales that was going to close the bar down, which, right. which was good, but, um, very genuine guy cares a lot. Um, and I haven't talked to him in a while, but I could text him right now and he returned my text and he's, he's helped me post blade a lot, whether it's how to, you know, negotiate an offer or make an introduction for me or get me involved in other companies. So I'd say that's one of the reasons that this crew is special and has stayed together because he cares and and we all help each other right i mean you know i i think i told you guys earlier i called adam on some advice probably two months ago and we spent an hour together on the phone i've talked to scott davis at Fougere, right so it's like we're pretty night tight-knit crew that that uh that's that's there for each other and, and yeah. so is john i'm surprised you don't have a whatsapp group <laughs> I know. I, maybe we do. I don't know. Maybe yeah. We do. Yeah. But it's funny because, you know, we, we talk about this and you know, we're releasing another series of podcasts, which look at uh, um, kind of Israel and the startup world um, in tech out in Israel and their community as community. Very tight. Very are tight. Ridiculously very tight. tight. Um, which is probably why, as as a as a very small nation, they're very very successful. Which is a similar story to to what you're talking about, but on a smaller scale with just a set of business colleagues. Um, yeah. But they have WhatsApp groups. They have WhatsApp groups for absolutely everything, and they're all about sharing information and supporting one another, which is really really interesting um, and really, really nice to see. So so just going back to. Um... To, to blade logic um you guys were obviously it, it, you were obviously doing really well you went through an ipo and then you found yourself acquired by bmc um must have been quite an interesting transition for you you know personally what was your initial response to that whole acquisition you know what was the sentiment like in the camp so i i'll, I'll never forget it i i woke up 
early one morning, it was probably six in the morning, and I have a email from David Acheria that we had just been acquired, I think it was 800 million by BMC. Yep. I didn't really know BMC well, um, but I did a little homework. I'm like, wow, 25 year old software company out of Houston <laughs> <laughs> versus this like hard charging East Coast Boston machine, right? And so it, it was a big time culture clash uh, just in terms of how we operated. Um, yeah. And, and uh, that was an interesting time. Uh, John wound up getting promoted to run, run all of sales globally. And I had been promoted just before the acquisition. So I was moving into a first, first line gig. Um, but it was, it was interesting. And um, I guess a lot of us moved up and, and changes were made swiftly. And, um, and, you know, he, he quickly implemented his methodology and, and medic and accountability. And he got just, just like he had with us, he got buy-in from the top with, uh, with the BMC leadership team. And we had a really good run. I mean, I, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, we did well for several years. One of the things that I'll kind of reflect, just going back to this series itself, is if you look through some of the names of the individuals, um, you know, we, 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 you know, if you exclude even the kind of app D guys, but just look at the blade logic guys themselves, you guys scale businesses faster than absolutely anyone else, right? In terms of your, your trajectory, your sales, your, your recruitment. But one of the things which is overlooked is your ability to transform culture quicker than anyone, you know? And I think the BMC acquisition is a real example of how a small, part of the business can transform the cal the culture of a mammoth. Uh, uh, Mark described it as a speedboat taking over an aircraft carrier. That was his, uh, <laughs> that was his quote. So uh, that's uh, a good, that's a good, it's a good analogy. Yeah. So, so what, what, what would you say about that? You know, the, the, the whole cultural transformation piece. I think it's absolutely true. I mean, part of it's the playbook and just the expectations and and the way that 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 we manage and and what we do in terms of the actual, you know, sales process and and medic and that kind of stuff. But it's it's mindset too. I mean, I just had my sales kickoff in January. I'm new. I'm there a month in, and I didn't talk about product. I didn't talk about go to market. I talked about what what makes me what what my culture is and and i just told a story and it was a, around you know the will to win and competitiveness and making yourself better every day you get stagnant right so i use i use this you know you can use michael jordan analogies or steph curry that if steph's the number one basketball player in the world or at least used to be and he's shooting 2000 free throws a week why aren't we working on our skills as sales professionals if we think we're elite, right? So it's it's that that similar thing. I think um, I think adversity for me is an important part of of how I run my org because you're going to have adversity, right? It's, bad stuff's going to happen, and I might have learned that from Latticer the best. But if bad stuff happens, how are you going to react to it? You're going to put your head in the sand or are you going to complain? You're going to be a cancer or are you going to deal with it and move on and, and figure out how to build yourself up. Right. Um, and then I've, I've, you know, I think it's these companies become like families and it, you spend so much time together and you build relationships and there'll be, there'll be tough times. There'll be tough conversations, but there'll be, there'll be good times too. Right. So that, that's kind of what I try to drive towards. You've mentioned about playbooks, like you have a manual that you refer to. What can you tell us about your playbook? You know, you've touched on a few points, but what is your, what is it? What is your playbook? Uh, there's several components that goes into it. Um, 
there's the sales playbook, but there's my playbook in general as a leader. And clearly we talked about, I mean, recruitment is number one. That's the first thing I did when I got to private tours, looked at my talent and uh, figured out who to bring in and, and what profile. I was fortunate that probably 50% of my new hires have been worked for me in the past, uh, either once or multiple times. Um, medic is obviously an, a, a, probably an overused term now, yeah. but it's, it's still fundamental to my playbook. I think uh, I've, I've tried to take things to the next level in terms of really being data driven in terms of my opportunity management and my sales stages and, you know, top of the funnel pipeline management and uh, really pipeline gen is key to my playbook. So one of the first things I did here was go scale my SDR team. We had zero and I brought in one of my leaders from Cloudera that worked for me there. And within 45 days, we had nine SDRs and it took them, you know, 14 days to get productive. So that's a whole, a whole new yeah. dimension. Yeah. It wasn't part of blade logic. Like we might've had a couple, but with the last, you know, I'd say probably 10 years, um, that whole SDR function is now paramount. Like if you look at any of those high growth companies like Apti or, or Mongo, Cloudera, I, had, I started that from scratch with zero. When I left, there was 50, right? So that, that whole engine is, is really part of my playbook now, both from you know, generating pipeline, but also I see that team as my future stars. That's my farm league to go be field reps, right? And if I'm, yep. if I'm doing my job right, training and growing, I can segment the market. And then that's how I build capacity within, within my field team. And I've trained them, right? It's not coming from the outside. Um, so what so, makes the success of a successful SDR team? We, no one's actually covered it as, a, as, a, as an actual area as of yet. You know, what is the success? Same, you've got like, fairly, like, like, same, fairly like, almost team, very, right? like my, my profile, and it's funny, I, I, I almost have a similar story to John does about SDR. So my, I have a really, really top notch sales team at Cloudera. And now if I look back, there's probably four to five that are CROs or VPs <laughs> of sales. Wow. And, and 10 that are successful field reps. So, um, I'll, I'll give you my, one of my, my first hire at Cloudera, uh, was a kid right out of UCLA. Didn't know him. All American rugby player played a Jesuit, which is kind of a similar school to De La Salle. Had a three, eight was a business major. His mom was a CEO of union of, of a, a newspaper and he was looking at investment banking or us. So I'm like, this is the perfect profile for me. And so I <laughs> built around that. He was a star, right? And, uh, well, he's a successful rep in the Valley today. So I think it's the same thing really. I mean, it's yeah. having, it's having commitment to it mm -hmm. that this is an engine um, it's the tip of the spear. You got to hire well, you got to train them well, and you got to manage them well, and you just got to get them all on the same page and they've got to be integrated with, with the field reps and with marketing. So that's does that, big... yeah. Does that then take away the demand generation from your actual field reps or is there still an expectation for your field reps to be going good out there? Good, good, good question. Uh, hundred percent. They should still be accountable. They should be the best prospectors in the company. So, um, I get asked that a lot. I've actually been asked that by boards and VCs, you know, but, um, no, they're still accountable to go do their own through, through a partner ecosystem or, or their own efforts or, or through their, their past relationships. So from, for me, the, the PG is a multi-pronged approach. It's, it's what marketing's doing from a, a website inbound digital dimension. It's, it's field marketing events, it's partner, it's the SDRs outbound and it's the, uh, and it's the AEs. And once you get that machine well integrated is how you really take off to the next level. 
And that's, I think a lot of us have, have learned and evolved. None of that stuff kind of existed at Blade Logic. It was way more, hey, here's your territory, no SDRs, no field marketing. Nobody knew Blade Logic, at least in the Bay Area. We just had to go hunt and kill, mm. right? And so that's really transform. I mean, you, you, yeah. you can't get to a hundred million ARR as fast as some of these companies are doing without having that engine in place. So, yeah. Incredible. So, so, so when you're hiring potential, are you, how long do you need to give it before it bears its fruit? You know, that's obviously the trade-off, right? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not hiring experience and you want to create these, these, I, you know, uh, I, I, I can generally tell in two weeks. Really? I can tell the, the type of person. I can tell the level of engagement, um, how involved they are, if they're asking for help, if they're already getting meetings, or if they're sitting back trying to figure stuff out. Um, that doesn't mean I, I, you know, we'll get rid of somebody after two weeks, but I can generally tell very early on how successful somebody's going to be um and i think at, at the end of 90 days you can you can absolutely almost certainly certainty tell as well so i think just to i think go back and recap because obviously we're we're at privatar at the moment um following blade logic you joined moxie where you're a vp of northern america yep. there for a year and a half then moved into Cloudera, which has a really exciting, obviously, story to tell. VP of Sales West, right? Very successful years there. Very successful. We had a we had a really good run, and I joined Cloudera about the time uh, when uh, they were doing about ten million. So it was about the same size as Privatar, um, right? Uh, Series B company, and going back to John, I think I actually got into cloud air through Greylock because John had introduced us to a bunch of us like Adam and Brian and, and others to Jeff Markowitz who ran recruiting at, um, at Greylock at the time and uh, really good story. And, um, you know, we scaled that to geez, when I left, we were doing North of 200 million and I had 50 AEs under me. And uh, it was it was a good story, really good company, and uh, had a good time doing that. And it was an opportunity for me to come in and implement a lot of the things that I knew. They didn't they weren't using medic. They didn't have an SDR machine. They didn't have a sales process. So I reported to uh, Kirk Dunn, who was the COO at the time, and I was kind of his right hand man doing a lot of the stuff, which was rewarding to me. And um, I did a lot of stuff, but I ultimately wound up running in the West. Yeah, so that was a good run. I've just got a question around that. So obviously you're, you're in a rhythm at Blade Logic. Obviously sales, marketing, it's working, right? And then you just come out of, your, out of that comfort zone into these, into these new organizations. How, how did you re react to, to a new type of rhythm? Was there a frustration or did your reputation allow you to go in and influence in the way that you needed to, to get the results that you needed? Uh, at Cloudera specifically? Well, it, it, you know, just, just Cloudera, Moxie, just generally that transition out of that comfort zone into a, a new rhythm. I'm a, I'm a builder. So yep. um, Privatar is my seventh startup. And so I've, I've been... <laughs> been fortunate to be through three IPOs. So I've seen it before. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, I, I, I got bored at BMC when, when it's, you know, two, $3 billion company and there it's just, it's, it's too big. I want to have more of an influence. So I think uh, I've always reported to the CEO or, or COO or somebody near the top, which, which gave us the reins to go do that. And that's, that's why you get hired, right. To go mm -hmm. change culture and, and, and deliver. So. Yeah. Um, I think following on, well, sorry, Simon, just to follow on from, from Cloudera, then on to next labs where you're the senior vice president, bigger role, bigger region of worldwide sales, right? Again, yeah. number three, very successful years there. Yeah. So I, um, 
again, goes back to a mentor. So uh, Kirk Bowman, who was a partner at Excel, ran PTC, very successful CRO on his own right. Uh, it, uh, we've, we were in touch on that one. And so that, that was my entry point there. And sa same playbook, right? I mean, <laughs> same playbook, build your team, implement the process, build up the pipeline, figure out where the inefficiencies are, how to what your customers are doing too is, is something I left out, like really understanding the sales motion, the buyer persona, who's the right vertical, what's the use case, uh, which comes out of the value framework, which you guys are going to talk to you with Kaplan about. Right. Mm. So I think, right, yeah. I think I left that part out, but that's that whole value framework and aligning to business initiatives and what the pain is and, and what the use cases are and who to go sell to is, is paramount, right? I mean, that, that's an underpinning of this whole story. So, so just to kind of reinforce, you're referring to John Kaplan at Force, Force yeah. Management. Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, and you've actually, you, 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 that's a big part of your playbook. You know, the whole training, the whole kind of development, that's, that is a core fundamental pillar. Um, how much training are you doing with your guys? Just, just, you know, so we, uh, a very big, that's a very big part of my, my playbook. So I've got a full-time VP of enablement. And when you, before you start at Privitar, you have uh, content that, that you are uh, expected to get familiar with. There's a two or three day boot camp. It's on Zoom right now because we're in this COVID situation, but um, uh, it's intense. And, you know, it's, it's back to back to back days and, um, similar to, similar to what John did. You've, you've got to learn the whiteboard pitch. You got to record it. You got to learn the corporate presentation. You got to record it. Um, we, we measure that. Um, so that's a very big part because my, my job is to get these reps as produ productive as, as quick as possible. So my, my target six months at plan, get them in, get them trained up as fast as they can. So you got to be organized. Um, it's a very big cultural thing too that you're organized on the front end. That a new, as a new employee comes in, that they feel like you have a plan and your act together, and that you're gonna enable them and that you are organized. So that that's been a very big thing for me. Um, and so that that's really paramount. We have every Monday morning I have a forecast call and there's a half hour, we call it a sprint training after that on a, on a variety of topics. So it's continually reinforced every QBR. I do a full day of training. So that, that, that's a big, big thing. Do you adopt the test as well? We do. You, you've adopted yeah. that. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Have you uh, done any quizzes and questions? In your QBR stand-up meeting, <laughs> and pulled sixty if you start <laughs> questions uh, at them. Not, not, not as, not as, not like John, but I, it's I, coming, I do. Though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so just tell us a little bit about your end game, Patrick. You know what? What's the what's the end game? What's the big picture for you? Uh, end game for me. Obviously, I want to make uh, Privator a the next you know, Okta or Apti or Mongo. So that, that's, that's what I'm focused on right now. Uh, I think we have a tremendous opportunity. I've always wanted to start a company. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if that comes to fruition. I've, I've, I've had several ideas that I've passed on that, that, uh, that, that bug me, right? <laughs> um, or, or go try to take a shot at a CEO job. And, you know, if you were to kind of reflect back over your career, how much of it was planned? Did you always know this is how it's going to be or was it reactive? Uh, you kind of just, when you're, when you're early in your career, you just, you get tunnel vision, right? And you, and at least I do, and you try to be successful as you can. I think I overmanaged my career on the front end. I didn't really know what was out there and what was possible. So I spent, I think, five years at Intro or four years at Everdream. If I had to do it over again, I would have, I would have been more aggressive in that. Um, why, why is that? I just think opportunity cost. There's a, I'm, I'm a loyal. I don't, I don't jump around a lot. But as you gather wisdom, 
it's like you got to be the mercenary of your own career because no one else is going to do it right and so uh, i i think i think that's one thing i think i think blade was a tipping point in my career about uh getting involved with just a whole nother level not that my other two companies weren't good because they were but it, it was it just felt like the next gear and um i think who you're around and the level of skill and and pedigree translates into performance in my opinion because if 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 you're out playing golf and and you're a good golfer and you're playing with you know high handicapper you're, you're just not going to be in it like you normally would right and so i think that was a that was a big tipping point um do you think you would have got to where you've got to had it not been for blade logic hard to say <laughs> I, I i mean hard hard, hard to say because i was performing but um the trajectory very, might have been different right but trajectory might have, i i would say the i i, I mean I, I don't know i don't know how to answer that question because i i'm i'm confident myself but i think it was i'm very fortunate to have that experience and probably not but you know certainly the the level of respect has been immense just in terms of being part of that experience and 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 what i've learned and what do you uh, mean by respect the blade logic name carries cachet right and uh and it's and it's well known especially now after after all the exits and successful companies that that have come out of that you know at least the cro level out of the mcmahon coaching tree that you guys <laughs> that you guys talked about on the front end so so what about the person outside of work then um you know do you spend and do you have much time out of work? Is there is there a good work life balance for you, or do you find yourself? Uh, I, 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 I've struggled with that. Right. <laughs> uh, I've I've gotten better as I've as I've wisened up over the years. So um, I I I work my my butt off. Uh, I'm up at usually five or six in the morning, getting my stuff done. I've got older kids now, so. I've got uh, freshman and sophomore in high school. So um, that has freed me up. I don't have toddlers running around. Um, yeah. But uh, spend a lot of time with them. Um, it's, you know, fun to, to do that and um, try to stay active. I'm, I'm always on the golf course in my free time or, or mountain biking or playing tennis or working out. Um, that so, competitive nature won't leave you, will it, Patrick? Uh, well, it's funny because my my son's now sixteen, and I've always I've always whooped him. And we went out <laughs> on the mountain. We went out on the mountain bike about a month ago, and he crushed me. And he was just laughing, and it's like, <laughs> and I was pissed. And it's like changing of the guard. Right? Oh, yeah. But uh, but I I love this stuff, right? I wouldn't be doing it if I don't. I I can't picture myself. Um, doing anything else and it starts with passion you, you, mm. just, you can't fit you can't fake it right mm. and it, you're going to be miserable if 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 you're doing something that you don't love and I, I never really think back as to oh i wish i had a stayed with real estate or done something else i think um it's been a been a good good life and good career and and it's and i have fun doing it so do a lot of these influences being a father myself do these a lot of these influences Pass, do you pass them on to your children, you know, and to your sons? Is it kind of, you know, in lots of stuff that you've learned, you know, this, do, do you see it in them that they've naturally picked that up or as, you know, competitive people, or do you think it's in your blood, I suppose, is the, uh, is the, is the question there? Uh, d definitely in my side of the family's blood. My, my right. sister is crazy successful and, uh, She's a lawyer, but that's another story. But uh, right. yeah, absolutely. I try to try to instill those values and you know that accountability and trying to get the most out of yourself. I think fortunately, my son's going through the same program, so right, I, I can let him go through that experience. <laughs> um, yeah, which I laugh, which I laugh at. It's I mean, not in a funny way, but it's just it's it's great. So, 
And do you my think other one's going to be a freshman there next year. So right. Do you think right. they go go into software sales or software the software the end software industry or? Uh, I don't know, but if yeah. they do, uh, they can certainly get a leg up and, and be well-trained, right? <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. That's um, what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I, 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 to John. I, I hope they do. Yeah. Because, um, they, you know, the, the so young you kids now are, they're, they're interning in SDRs is, is, you know, junior in college. Right. And so. You can literally, if you decide to do that, uh, be dangerous by the time you're 22. For sure. And we were funny enough, we were talking about this before you came on air, which is, and this is where the kind of questions leading on to, which is understanding the millennials, right? And, you know, the, the stigma that's attached to them. Do you yeah. think they will be able to take to it as well as you have with all I, of the, I, the elements I, that I, I, I've, I've, I've definitely experienced that. That is, mm. that is a real thing um, about, you know, just entitlement and, and wanting to get promoted after two months and, and not, not grinding it out, not mm. your stripes. Um, but look, there's, look, I, I look at, I look at my, my SDRs now and they're, they all have great attitudes. They want to win, you know, I, I, I love the story about one of my SDRs at, um, at Cloudera. He was actually in high school, 18, and he was an SDR. He was the first one. And I think his cousin or something worked for Oracle, but he wound up just take, he wound up bypassing college and doing his degree online at Arizona State. And literally by the time he was 23, I think he was a full-blown sales rep. Huh. And he's now over in London working for Procore, running that entire region. I don't even think wow. he's thirty yet. Wow, so it's it, that's the kind of pedigree, right? Like you, yeah, you get the right get the right individual. They they'll make their own way. Yeah. Patrick, how, how do you keep? In, in, how do you ensure that you keep evolving? Because it's very easy to get stuck in in your way you know, stuck with a playbook, which is 30 years old, because the playbook right. we're talking about isn't a blade logic playbook. No. It's a PTC. It's, um, it's, yeah, I, I, I've certainly morphed it. No question. Um, yeah. and you have to, right. Mm. Uh, I pay attention. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm constantly looking at, at what other companies are doing and, and talking to people and you can't, you can't be, too egotistical or, or proud to change your ways because there's new innovative ideas. I mean, the way that sales was run 10 years ago is completely different than now. Um, and so that's, that's a big thing, mm -hmm. but, uh, I read a lot. I network a lot, try to talk to my peers, look at what other companies are doing. Um, you know, there's so much technology out there too, that, uh, I'll, I'll spot check and engage with certain technologies every once in a while to get their pitch and to, and to see what they're doing. Interesting. So look, I think before we come on to our final two questions, which we always like to close the show with, um, is there anything else about this story that you feel that be interesting to talk about at this stage? Do you think there's anything we've missed out? Just think it's phenomenal. I, I, I want to know the, the gross market cap out of all the, uh, <laughs> we're working that out. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got analysts at the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I look at Datadog and they're 20 billion and Mongo 20 billion. It's absolutely insane to me. Yeah. We've got, uh, we've got analysts working on all these figures and these figures will be released at the point yeah. of, the, of the show. What we yeah. do know. No, I just, mm. yeah, I, I think, it, I think it's awesome. And, uh, if, if you look at, John, I always think about the great NFL coaches, you know, Bill Walsh or Bill Bell, Bill Parcells and all the coaches that came out of those uh, leadership teams that are, that have won Super Bowls. It's kind of a similar parallel, you know, hundred percent. Bill Belichick was Bill Parcells right hand man for years mm. and, and look what he's done. Right. And yeah. Mike Rabel was one of, uh, Belichick's linebackers and he went to the Super Bowl last year, right? So mm. it's, it's just yeah, very cool. Yeah, 
It's a, you and everyone, name, everybody's I mean, had you their can't, name, name another, name another, you, you wouldn't be doing this show if it wasn't true, but name another regime, so to speak, mm. that's had this level of success widespread in, in, I, I, in the software industry or any in technology there isn't yeah, which is why this story yeah. is so so unique yeah. um as i said when you have a look at the paradox across everything mark musselman he described it as the bones brigades famous skateboarding crew <laughs> um, obviously he's got vert ramp in his garden you yeah, know he's yeah, always oh, gonna, yeah. he's always yeah. going to drive it towards something like that brian blonde did did, did did musselman talk about his dj career he did, he yeah. Did. Yeah, <laughs> we got that. Yeah, so, we got that. So I think he was the one exception to McMahon's profile. But he was right. very successful. Yeah. He was the rebel. Did. He was the rebel. That's yeah. uh, and that's why that's such an incredible story. We're yeah, so he glad was a, for, uh, he was the par he shot one. parakeets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna that his part of the story. He's, he's gonna be pissed about that. <laughs> uh. We might have to have a follow up on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, as you said, Brian Blonde spoke about it quite timingly. App that you know the the last dance, the balls, Michael Jordan, etc. Um, and the team that was growing there, and you know their success. And as you say, there there isn't anything which makes this story so unique and so interesting and so captivating um so as i said we've got a couple of questions which are our closing questions um before simon's final conclusion which is you know we always like to uh, give, ask for advice you know individuals that are looking to break that glass ceiling what three bits of advice can you give them or more if you need to <laughs> i, I kind of talked about it earlier i mean mm. believe in yourself don't don't uh, don't let put people put barriers around you. It sounds it sounds like a cliche, but you know, I, like I said, when I when I when I transitioned into Blade Logic, I, there was a whole new world for me. I didn't know like the next level of what could be accomplished, right? And so, I think it's just keep going and don't overmanage your career, right? Take take some risk, uh, and, and go for it. Um, I think another thing that, that is a little going to sound anti what I just said is to pick really good companies. That's a really, really hard thing to do. And I, I've, I've been burned a couple of times. And one thing that John always says to all of his guys is, you know, don't confuse the, the opportunity with the role. So all those guys that went to Snowflake that weren't, you know, CROs that took mid-level jobs are pretty damn happy right now, right? And <laughs> so it's really, it's really, you know, being disciplined and, and not jumping at the first thing, but, um, but picking, picking the right opportunity for the reasons I described, I came from Protor, yeah. right? So, and uh, I think you gotta have passion. You gotta have passion for what you do. Yeah. And if you don't, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna show up all over the place, right? I, I always tell reps that they, they get in a rut, like no, no grumpy sales rep ever sold anything, right? You gotta be, you gotta be on your game and you gotta, you, that, that, that comes across good and bad, right? If you have passion that comes across and if you don't, you don't, right? So, and so. So true. So I suppose the final question is, um, does the hunter make the unicorn? What's, what's your opinion on that? I think absolutely. Yeah, I um, I don't know what Blade was doing before John got there. Uh, I don't think they were smashing it, and he certainly turned things around quickly. And uh, and look and look at the success. So I think there's been, you know, you could you could name a hundred stories of good products that were built by engineers in Silicon Valley that 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 never did anything. Um, I, look, I look at Mongo. So I was in the big data space at Cloudera. Um, I started in 2012 and Mongo wasn't on the map. Really, they were, they were just kind of chugging along. I never saw them in deals. And then, you know, Dave and Carlos got there and the rest is history, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, 
same with Okta, another good example. Adam was super early there and look what happened. So, so yes, the hunters. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I suppose as a, as a bit of a conclusion, uh, Patrick, I think um, I asked you quite an interesting question and I just want to reflect on that really, which was, would you have got to where you've got to had you not gone through Blade Logic? And I think it's not a straightforward answer. And the reason why it's not a straightforward answer is because if you look at your early career or even pre pre career back at college, um, you had a winning mentality. You had a formula in yourself to be disciplined, to be methodical, to be competitive. And it's impossible to hold that kind of potential back. But I think what's really special is that you, like the other 33 that we're referring to, you all had this opportunity to be part of a story where you met John and the other influencers, because there were other influencers that were, in, that were part of this success story. And what it did was give you the tools, gave you the focus, gave you the things that it might have taken you a lot longer to work out, it surrounded you with like-minded individuals that were made with the same DNA. And that melting pot is the reason why you guys have gone onto the trajectory that you have. And I think that it's important that we reflect and we recognize the individuals, the circumstance, but as a story, it's incredible to see the results uh, that you guys I, have gone on to achieve. I a thousand percent agree with what you just said. No question. Wonderful. Well, yeah. Patrick, you've been a fantastic guest. Um, we really, really are grateful that you've taken the time to speak with us. Hope you have enjoyed it. It's been awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you so much again, Patrick. Thanks ever so much for spending time with us today. Mm -hmm.